We are not going to April Fools you all today. No gimmicky. I never agreed to that. No gimmicky. I never agreed to I'm that. I'm not going to do it. A no gimmicky. Whoa, the Steelers just traded for five. No, I'm not doing it. Okay. It's 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 tired, quite frankly. I don't like going online on, on social media and seeing fake press release and fake, you know, deep fakes, whatever it is. All I know right now is football, maybe a little basketball. And look at this, an Easter candy. If you know, you know, okay? This is primo right here. If you know, you know, Daffod's Candy, Sharon, Pennsylvania. Got to have it. Um, one thing that's not an April Fool's is um, the, the the Pirates are 4-0. <laughs> Somehow that's the that's the that non-April is, Fool's joke. That, that, is right. a, that is not April Fool's, everybody. If you're a Buckos fan, like, that was a heck of an opening series. Sure was. Uh, that's even with Bailey Falter pitching uh, one of those games. You know, what's funny is you know, I was at my dad's yesterday, and <laughs> we had the start of the game on. He's a Guardians fan, but we were watching the start of the Pirates game before they came on, and Lo and behold, Bailey Falter starts, and it's 5 nothing, just like that. And I go, well, this one's over. And then they win. So who do I know? I the battle on Buckos, man. That's right. All right. Mark, football. Mark, football. Is a, Mark has been a member for 10 months, and we appreciate yeah. you. Job, we Mark. appreciate you joining us. He's Chris Halleck. I'm Corey Chris, and today is April 1st, 2024. I am not going to April Fool's you all. Chris can do it if he wants, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I'll just sit here and react. We are officially in draft month, 24 more full days until the NFL draft commences from Detroit, Michigan. However, obviously the Steelers brass and and those that need to be on the South side will be on the South side, including myself and DK, uh, of course, for this yearly event. And this is the time of the year where we are looking at the top 30 visits at the Who's going where across the National Football League and who's talking to what teams? And of course, this has been going on for months now between the Senior Bowl, the Combine, of course, uh, and now Pro Days. But this is where things really start picking up in terms of these teams finalizing their draft boards, of course, with the Steelers. There is no difference there. Yeah, um, it's I mean, this is the time of year where where we're going to see these pre-draft visits really kind of take off. Uh, you know, Steelers have used 11 of their 30 allotted pre-draft visits, uh, popular call popularly called top 30 visits on, uh, social media. Um, I don't think that's the actual term for it, but, uh, uh, it's fine. Uh, it, if you ever want to irritate Jim, uh, Nagy, the guy, the director of the senior bowl, he hates that. That's like, that's like, that's like nails on a chalkboard to him. Yeah. Um, but uh, either way, you know, each team gets 30 allotted visits. Um, that does not count local visits. So for, for the Steelers that, you know, anybody from Pitt, West Virginia, a- any anybody that will be considered a local school, and both Pitt and West Virginia are, are those schools. Uh, they don't count. Penn State, I, I think, counts as, uh, as, as well as a local visit. So, um, you know, the, the 11 of 30 so far. So we're still going to see plenty more guys, you know, go to the South side, have their pre pre draft visit. But if you look at it and I, I need to, I'm, I'm a little unprepared today, but um, I, um, if you go and if you go to the list, which I, I have currently in our Steelers feed at uh, DK Pittsburgh sports right now, I've got I've, of the, of the 11 that they've had so far that don't count toward the, that, or at least not counting the local ones. You've got one, two, three receivers, four or three offensive tackles, and three defensive tackles or defensive linemen. So that's, I mean, that's nine of the 11 dedicated to receiver, tackle, and defensive line. And then if you go to the local visits, they've got a cornerback. Uh, who was it? Um, Devin Shire from Pitt, and yep. then uh, Zach Frazier, the center from West Virginia. And can, and can solve us the tackle from Pitt as well. Yeah. Uh, so you got, there's no smoke screen here. And, and that's the, that's the, the, the title of the episode today. Like there's no smoke screen here. The Steelers are, are showing you exactly what they're prioritizing here, heading into the draft. The trenches are a big part of that. Uh, receiver is going to be a big part of that. Um, especially when you look at some of the receivers that, that they've brought in. I, you know, you look, look at the kid from South Carolina. He's been in for a pre-draft visit. He could be their late second round, early third round. Um, you know, 
again, a lot of the times the Steelers, especially this offseason, we've seen like, are the Steelers actually going to do this? Or are they not going to do this? Like there's been a legitimate question about that because of some of the things that they've done. But when it comes to their attitude going into the draft, from everything that I've heard on the inside that they're not broadcasting. And then with actual stuff you can see like pre-draft visits, there's no smoke screen here. The Steelers are showing you exactly what their, what their priorities are going into the draft, which is nothing new either. If you look at track no. records in recent memory and they tend to go visit the pro day of the player they take in the first round, that is also a trend. Yeah. And if you, if you look at the pro day circuits, they spent time at, you could see it and kind of make your own educated guess. That's 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 you sitting at home. That's me sitting here. That's Chris sitting there. Mm -hmm. Any of us can do this just by looking and just by paying attention. And no, B. Phil says the Steelers do not spoke screen. They're not doing that now, especially these top 30 visits. There are so many draft prospects. They've tried in the past. They have. There was that there was like when they took Kenny Pickett, there was that Malik Willis smoke screen a little bit going on. But yeah. again, you know, like I remember Dale is the one who reported that the Steelers were interested in Kenny Pickett. I think that was going all the way back to the Senior Bowl. Mm -hmm. um, you get people who know who know people on the inside. You, you're going to figure out wh where you're going to figure some stuff out. You know, you're going to figure out the right stuff. So it doesn't even then. Sometimes right. the smoke screens are exactly that. Like people know it's BS. <laughs> right up until a certain point, though, and and right now, yeah. Omar Khan, Mike Tomlin, the powers that be are not going to want to quote unquote, I use the word waste here. They're not going to want to waste one of those top thirties on someone they know they're not going to take. Yeah. They're not going to bring somebody in that they don't think they have a legitimate shot of, of at least establishing relationship with. Now, all of this other stuff that's happened pre-draft, like, like there was reports coming out of Indianapolis that Roma Dunsey, the top wide receiver from Washington uh, consensus, top 10 mocked draft pick met with the Steelers in Indianapolis. Now, that's totally fine and dandy. Now, if the Steelers want to draft them, they'll have to trade up to do so. That's just the bottom line. They're not yeah. going to get him at 20. So if they want him that badly, they'll have to move up. But also, this goes back to the Will Anderson thing that I that I talked about ad nauseum and, and reported last year and, and talking about Mike Tomlin gleaming, beaming about Will Anderson and meeting him in the pre-draft process down at Pro Day at Alabama, knowing mm -hmm. damn well they were not going to get him with that draft pick last year because Will Anderson was the best consensus defensive player on the board. That being said, three, four years from now, four or five years from now, whatever it is, if Will Anderson, Texans pass rusher, is a free agent, you better believe that Mike Tomlin's going to be interested in him. So that's part of the process as well, but this time of year is different. This time of year, once you get to April, once you get to these top 30 visits in late March and early April, this is where it gets a little more serious. And these names that – are getting reported visiting the South side. Like I remember last year I saw Tri uh, Christian Gonzalez, the Oregon cornerback going for a pre-draft visit. And I'm like, yeah. I, I mean, I saw him walk into the building and I go, okay, that's something. And, and again, this is with the knowledge that they were looking for cornerbacks like Joey Porter jr. And lo and behold, mm -hmm. they, they pass on Gonzalez or, or at least prioritize Broderick Jones over Gonzalez and yeah. sit and wait with that 32nd pick and, and land up with Joey jr. Anyway. Yeah. Um, one guy that I know for sure that they really, really like is Fuaga out of Oregon State. Now, he's been in for a pre-draft visit. They were not at that. Uh, now, I, I'm sure that there was I, I think maybe Pat Meyer was at the Oregon State Pro Day. I don't remember for sure, but that was not one. The Steelers had a strong contingent you know, it present for the Oregon. And, and that's not atypical either. You know, a, a lot of the times when you see the strong can do like the full attendance contingent contingent from the Steelers. It's yeah. Georgia, it's Michigan. It, it's, it's those schools. It's primarily sec and big 10. Uh, you're not going to see a lot of stuff out on the West coast, but um, I do know that, you know, their pre-draft visit with him was, they were impressed. And now granted he's the second, according to PFF he's the second best tackle on the board. So the Steelers are not the only team who really likes Fuaga, right? <laughs> so yeah. um I I I think if if they could somehow get away with somehow trading up to get him, but I think you're gonna have to trade up too far to get to try to get him. So I don't think that that's realistic. But you know, you get certain, you know, and this is another another facet of the uh, of the of the pre-draft visit and the whole pro day circuit and everything like that is even if you don't end up getting this guy in the draft, who says something can't happen down the road? You know, right. uh, we've seen that ha even like, like one guy who really kind of 
sticks out to me. That's not like a like a a major player or anything like that is Alanon Roberts. Like yeah. they had a really good visit with Alanon Roberts at his pro day when he was coming out, and you know, obviously the Steelers didn't take him, and he played you know elsewhere. Um, <laughs> Stephen A says that shotgun two beers we somehow got Fuaga. Uh, I think I think a lot of people on the south side would be celebrating if they got Fuaga, but um, might be a, a, there might be a beer consumed from the building in the south side <laughs> if they take Fuaga. I think there might be him. more than a beer. Yeah, I think there, there might be, be some harder some harder stuff that's yeah. uh, that's served. Celebratory. Um, Go to the top shelf cabinet for that. For that, but yeah. I, I think, but you know, you know, again, you know, you have those visits, and you're like, okay, well, maybe down the road. You know, there's something that can end up working out or, or whatever, you know, it, you, you just you never know. And, you know, that again, that happened with Elaine and Roberts when the opportunity came for them to get him in free agency. They did it. And lo and behold, look at what he did. You know, he was thought of as like only a guy who could stop the run, kind of like the, the like another version of Robert Spillane and ended up, ended up being a, a much better version of that. He yeah. ended up doing way more in coverage that than you anybody would anticipate. Um, now not saying that that's a guy you want drop you, you want as your primary coverage linebacker. I'm just saying that he did better than I think a lot of people expected. And maybe it's because the Steelers know how to get the, the most out of him. just going. And they knew that going all the way back to his pro day. Like, listen, we know how this guy operates. We know what buttons to push to get the absolute best out of him. And so that's why these visits are so important because they can learn, you know, and there was a lot of rumors coming out that their pre-draft visit with Christian Gonzalez didn't go well last year. Mm -hmm. And so you know, maybe they were really high on him. And then they have that visit. They're like, you know, this guy's not a stealer. That's why they bring him in. That's, that's why they that, do this. Yeah. Yeah. That's why, that's why they bring these guys in. And by the way, there's no wasted motion with all of this stuff. You know, you look at Fuaga, the Oregon State tackle. He has a relationship with Isaac Sayamala. They know each other very well. Obviously, there's a Polynesian connection, and they both played at Oregon State. So you better believe that Omar Khan, Mike Tomlin, Andy Weidel, whoever it is, is in the ear of Isaac Sayamalo asking about Tyler Fuaga. Make no yeah. mistake about this either. Reports came out of the Big 12 Pro Day. Of course, the conference did a big Pro Day for every team in the conference, which that's a whole story in and of itself. But Zach Frazier, of course, West Virginia yeah. Center, tested Pro Day. Guess who went for it? Isaac Williams. Mm -hmm. Isaac Williams was sent by Mike Tomlin to the Senior Bowl to coach offensive linemen. Who was mm -hmm. at the senior bowl? Zach Frazier. Yeah. These are not coincidence moves. Yeah. These things are happening on purpose. Yeah. Isaac Williams is back in the Big 12 Pro Day. I believe it's in Frisco for a reason. Mm -hmm. He went and coached at the senior bowl for a reason. Zach Frazier was at both spots. Isaac Williams is in both spots. Just do the math. It's it's not it's not that hard to see. Now yeah. you could look in January slash February at the senior bowl saying, okay. Yes, they send Isaac Williams down. That means something. But how much involvement are they actually putting into the offensive line? Mike Tomlin was hounding offensive linemen on the yeah. first day of senior bowl practice. There's no coincidence. Now, throughout the combine process, they're looking closely at offensive linemen. Now, in this process of pro days, they're looking closely at offensive linemen. They sent the Cavalry to Georgia, where Mims and Van Prant are testing. They sent the Cavalry to Michigan. Of course, Roman Wilson, but a couple linemen from Michigan, too. No secrets here. There's there's yeah. really no secrets here. I'm not I'm not no, telling you any insight of anything. This is just looking at it. This is the, just noticing what they're doing. The line now, is the, the line is a priority. Yeah. Big time. And, and now, and now with all of these relationships deeply established, mm -hmm. this is where they finalize things. And, and you mentioned it with Gonzalez, right? He, he goes to the south side, he gets looked at. You know they're looking at cornerbacks, and he kind of fits what they want at cornerback. Has that visit, and apparently it didn't impress Mike Tomlin or didn't impress whoever it was. So yeah. take him off the board, remove him. And that's why they do these kind of things. All right, I want to bring up yeah. a couple comments here. Uh, number one, Rick says the Tomlin fanboy fascination with players, they won't get as baffling. I can't call it that. I, I can't I'm call baffling. it that. This is this is what this is how you make relationships happen. This is any line of work, right? Even if even if Roma Dunsey is genuinely not going to be drafted by the Steelers or they don't have any interest in using a draft pick on him at all. That doesn't mean they don't want to talk to the kid, get to know him, see what the possibilities and the interest is down the road. And mm -hmm. again, I relate to the Will Anderson thing. If Will Anderson's a free agent in four or five years and he signs with the Steelers, I won't bat an eye on it because Mike Tomlin planted that seed last year. 
So yeah. the same the same thing happens this time of year. Mr. Nick of Time says, thoughts on J.C. Latham. Of course, that's the Alabama right tackle. Would he go before or after Fuaga? He probably goes after. after. And keep in mind, he's a right tackle by, by trade. So yeah. some teams that are looking specifically at right tackles might be prioritizing him or Tyler Guyton. Um, they might be looking at Mims at right tackle too. So he's he's in that class of three really strong right tackles that are getting graded first round. But I wouldn't anticipate Latham goes after uh, Fuaga, but he's a he's a good player too. This is a really deep class for tackles. Uh, really quick, you know, re- response to to Rick's comment about about Tomlin's fascination with with players they won't get. I'm like, you know, you go you know ahead of the 21 draft. I mean, it was very very clear and obvious that Mike Tomlin loved Justin Fields, and they stood no chance of getting him in that draft. Number one, like even if they were picking high enough to get him, they still had Ben Roethlisberger. Now, granted, they had Ben Roethlisberger probably going into his last year and ended up being his last year, but. I, 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 as long as Ben was the quarterback, I didn't see this team really investing a first round pick in a quarterback just because the, the, the thought process was always, we've got Ben, we've got a chance to win. Mm-hmm. Didn't matter if he was 24, 34, or if he played until he was 44, it just, it didn't matter. Um, that was just always the mentality. And so him being fascinated with Justin Fields wasn't going to produce anything, any kind of fruit in that 21 draft. But lo and behold, here they were here. They were just three seasons later with an opportunity to possibly acquire him in a trade, you know, and that's exactly what happened. Now they've got him. Now he's on their roster and lo and behold, he may end up another and, you know, made another comment that there's no guarantees that he's he'll be any good. And that's exactly that's exactly right. There might not be any guarantees that he'll be good. Uh, This may be a flop, but that's why you don't pick up the fifth year option on. And if he's no good, then you he's here for one year. You cut him loose. No big deal. You know, there's no risk with you gave up a sixth round pick to get him. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you don't know what's going to, how things are going to play out down the road. You don't know if Fuaga, for example, has, you know, some sort of whatever that happens down the road in three or four seasons. And then all of a sudden he's available for trade, or maybe they, he just goes straight up to free agency. And depending on where the Steelers are with their cap situation, maybe they can afford to pay top of the market, you know, price or whatever kind of price it would take to get Fuaga and to sign him. You never know what's going to happen down the road. So them planting all of these seeds with players that they have no chance of getting in this draft or with players that, could possibly be overreaching for or whatever. Um, it, it's it's part of the process, and I think it's done the Steelers a lot more good than it's done bad. Uh, and really, the Steelers aren't the only team that that does this. It's not just Mike Tomlin's, you know, way of operating. It's just Mike Tomlin commands the same way that people think that like Mike Tomlin gets starry eyed at, at certain players. A lot of players get that way with Mike Tomlin. Yeah. They just a lot of pl- a lot of players love playing for the guy. Yeah. yeah, I I have to step away really quick. I have a very loud child. Uh oh, <laughs> better go take care of that. It's important. That's something to do. And I think we can have this discussion in a longer frame in a different show because it's a really large topic. But there's also the concept of the Steelers moving up or trading back, depending on how the draft falls. Remember last year, Broderick Jones being available at 14. Reports came out that they might have had some intel that the Jets were going to take him at 15. And combine that with the theory, I'll say theory on this, that Bill Belichick, who had 14th overall pick with the Patriots last year, wanted to screw the Jets out of getting Broderick Jones, was pretty willing to deal with the Steelers, made it a little bit easier. And... The Steelers obviously had the capital move up. They chose to do so. They didn't have to give up the pick pick 32 to do it. And they end up with their cake and they eat it too. So at at a certain point, as I was just saying, Chris, we're going to have the discussion about should or would or could the Steelers trade up or should or would the could or could the Steelers trade back from 20. And I think there's arguments to be made either way. I think there's an obvious argument to be made to stay pat. Yeah, but at, at the same time, they showed that aggressiveness last year mm-hmm. in wanting to move up to get Broderick Jones, and things broke their way to do so. Uh, Evor, member for seven months, thank you, we appreciate yeah. that. And you know, now is the time to look seriously at the positions. And Chris mentioned it 
at the beginning of the show, the position groups that are being prioritized with these pre-draft visits, offensive tackle, defensive line, wide receiver are the top three. And it's no secret. This is who the Steelers have been looking at since day one of the senior bowl. And yeah. now that this process is entering the final home stretch, so to speak, they're going to solidify the, I guess you could say grades on each of these players at these positions. And let's, let's just be blunt. My, my top tackle might be different than Omar Khan's top tackle. And that might be different than Mike Tomlin's top tackle. It might be different than Chris's top tackle. I mean, that's just how this goes. Yeah. So just, it's going to come down to a consensus. And Jeff asks here, what scenario do you see them getting Fuaga? They have to trade up significantly. They would, probably. They, you would think they have to, but crazier crap has happened. Crazier stuff has happened where guys like him slip and guys like him fall. So well, if you, they're really high on him, one thing or another will have to happen. They'll have to trade up or hope or hope that he falls to 20 and the likelihood of him falling to 20 is very low. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's not falling to 20. Uh, I, I, there's got to be something that's, that happens during the remainder of the, the pre-draft visits wherever else he goes in which he starts failing physicals or there's got to be some sort of uh, major concern that would have him fall all the way to 20. Um, I think if the Steelers gotten into a certain range that maybe they're willing to trade up, if that if that's like the guy, if the, if I mean, if the pre-draft visit went so well that they're like, they're determined we're getting this guy no matter what, then, then maybe they do that. Maybe they trade up significantly from 20 to get him. Um, and, and then they go forward with Broderick Jones and, and Fuaga as, as their two tackles. Um, I, I, I don't necessarily, I don't want to completely rule it out because, you know, again, the Steelers don't trade up very often. And in Omar Khan's first draft, he traded up on the first, in the first round to go get Broderick Jones. So, you know, and Jim kind of says it here, you know, it, it all, it does depend on how, how the draft falls. You know, if, if there's a big run of quarterbacks early on, then that knocks all the other players further down the, further down the board. Um, that gives the Steelers a better chance to, okay, if they don't get Fuaga, which again, I don't see happening, but maybe, maybe, you know, JC Latham falls all the way, you know, to, to 20, or maybe he falls to a, to a range in which they only have to trade up two or three spots. Yeah, and so they don't really have to give up too much capital in order to go up and get get the guy that they really want. Uh, and I have reason to believe I'm not not as confident in this in terms of like what I've heard, but I I, I have reason to believe that they really like weigh them too. Uh, yeah. So and plus again, right tackle, you could have easily move Roderick Jones back over to, to the left side, and then there you go, you got Jones and and, and lay them as your two. Uh, I mean, SEC tackles, you got Georgia on one side, Alabama on the other side. I mean. Um, yeah, I, I think, um, uh, yeah. And, 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 and Pete here says, you know, power going to shifting to center, you say, he said powers Johnson is more likely to fall out of the first round because of concerns over his medicals. Yeah. Um, the, just that being the water cooler talk of the owners meetings was, was a big thing. Um, and if he, if he falls to me, there's not really a center that I'm, I'm not, I don't think the Steelers should be taking a 20. Uh, yeah, I just, I, I don't, I think that's a reach for any center. Now I thought powers Johnson, if everything checked out with medicals and stuff like that, I thought Jackson powers Johnson was a good pick at 20 Yeah, based but, off of what he can do. But if there's, if there's concerns with medicals and stuff like that, and, and maybe the Steelers bring him, bring him in and they, that, that's who they use one of their pre-draft visits on. And then that way they can get their eyes on them. They can get their hands on them and be like, okay, let's, let's let, let, let like let us, you know, evaluate him and, and let's see how comfortable we are when it comes to the medical stuff. And then if that doesn't work out, then yeah. yeah. Uh spices Broderick wants to play left. No, they want Broderick to play left. Omar Khan said he will be a left tackle. Uh so I think Broderick wants to play left too. I, I think, think so I, too. I think that's mutual. But at some point he will play left tackle. Um, yeah. now this is an exact science, but I, I just for the heck of it, I went on the old PFF mock draft simulator just <laughs> while you were talking there, okay? Now, tackles. You want to talk about tackles and like a run of tackles? Yeah. This, in my opinion, if the Steelers are prioritizing tackle, would be their worst fear. Joe, I, this is for this PFF mock draft I literally just ran a minute ago. 
Yeah. Okay, Joe Alt at seven to the Titans. This mm-hmm. is just tackles. Latham at 13 to the Raiders. Fashionu at 14 to the Saints. Fuaga at 15 to the Colts. Mims at 16 to the Seahawks. Uh, Fotano, the, the Washington tackle, at 18 to the Bengals. And then if you consider him a tackle, Graham Barton at 19 to the Rams. So right there, Alt, let's see, Alt, Latham, Fashionu, Fuaga, Mims, that's five. Fountainau, six, Barton, seven. That's seven players in the top 19 that could play tackle. That in this random mock draft I just ran, just went off the board before the Steelers could even sniff at 20. I will say this, though. I will say this. If Fuaga is there at 15, I'm trading up to get him. You make the move, right. Oh, my God. I will trade up to get him. You make the move. Um, okay. Let, let's, 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 okay. I'll run, I, I'll run a I, different mock draft simulator. Then. I got to I got to No, I got to have this. So Stephen A says PFF don't know nothing. And there's a couple of other people like booing PFF in the comments. Like, listen, the P, we, we got to We got to We got to separate between because it is almost like two entities here. Sure. We, we gotta, we gotta separate from PFF and then the PFF's grading system. PFF and their grading system is subjective. It is admittedly subjective by them. Um, when it comes to other stats that they provide a lot of the, if you guys like chalk talk that I write on the site, a lot of the stats that I pull are from pro football focus. It's from PFF, it, and they are stats that, that you can actually quantify, objective stats. You know, pass mm-hmm. rush win rate can be a subjective stat, but even then, the way that they calculate the grades is a subjective formula. It's not It's not like baseball war where you have a formula, you plug in the numbers, you, you, you hit the... You know, you hit the button to, to crunch the numbers and like Michael Scott, just crunch them, just crunch them. Um, and, and you get a number. Um, it's not like that. So whenever we whenever we talk about PFFs and like their mock draft simulator and everything like that, it's not like a it's not a terrible tool. I'm not doing my mock draft based off of PFF. Neither am but. I. All right. So if we want to play that game, here's Pro Football Network. Okay. And their mock draft simulator. All right. Pro Football Network. I just again. I ran it just as Chris ran through that. All at six to the Giants. That's one. Fashionu at seven to the Titans. That's two. Mims at 13 to the Raiders. That's three. Fountain out of the Saints at 14. That's four. Uh, Fuaga at 17 to the Jaguars. That's five. Fuaga's there at 17. This, oh my has, God. this has the Chiefs trading up to 18 where the Bengals are to take Latham. That's six. So this has six tackles going by the time the Steelers could look at 20. So, yeah, if Fuag is there at 15 or 17 or whatever, of course, you you do it. But my point is, now now if you want empirical data, here it is. You, you just saw it, okay? Two separate mock drafts had, five, had six and seven tackles being taken before the Steelers could even think about it at 20. <laughs> so, okay, it's not just PFF, maybe. Maybe this is just a really good tackle class, and some of the computer models and a lot of scouts will think that. Yeah. So... Yeah, if the Steelers want to tackle, they might have to get aggressive here is what we're saying. Uh, and, and the thing is, is that like even we can run every single mock draft simulator uh, on, on planet Earth, and none of that is going to actually compare to the intel that NFL GMs and NFL assistant GMs have not only on the class, on, uh, on the upcoming prospects, but on each other, right? Uh, that each team is doing their homework on – each player, but also doing their homework on all the teams picking in front of them, uh, which is, you know, again, when, when we even go back as recently as last year, the Steelers get up to 14 to take Broderick Jones because the Patriots knew that the Jets wanted Bro- Broderick Jones. And so they then played their game and let the Steelers get up there so that they could take Broderick Jones before the Jets could get him. I'm, I'm just laughing so, because when I went to the other medium to do the other mock draft, chat got really relatively quiet compared to when I bust out the PFF buzzword. Oh, so no. I just, just, I just wanted to know. I just wanted to note that. I just hey, wanted to note that. No, again, and listen, <laughs> I, I understand. I understand the disdain for PFF's grading system, and yeah. I have the same. I have very similar. The the main reason why I, I had not to get too much on a rabbit trail, but the main reason <laughs> I have an issue with the PFF grading system is that 
It's not that I disagree with their grading system. It's that their grading system has a stranglehold on so many people in this game where it's actually helping decide how awards are given. And that's a problem. That's a major problem. And, and that's, and because, you know, because, and, and Pete, you know, here says that, you know, for me, it's the same for the analysts. It's because all these analysts, everybody wants to be the smart guy. Everybody wants to be the guy that looks smarter than everybody else because the industry that, that Corey and I work in is, I don't know if you know this, it's very competitive. And so everybody wants to be the really smart guy. They want to be able to put themselves above everybody else. And so the trendy way to do that doesn't matter what sport you cover <laughs> is to go with the analytics is to go with the stats beyond is to go with the st- <laughs> is to go with the stats beyond what you can find in a box score. And with that happening, it's like all of the box score stats get completely discarded. And so now we're only looking at analytics and that's not what analytics are intended for. That's never what analytics have been intended for. Analytics have always have always been a tool that's there since it since their invention pretty much to help paint a broader picture and create context for the box score stats they go hand in they should go hand in hand Mm -hmm. that's what it should be that's not how they're being used but because that's the state of the game and because we have a subjective stat that so many people are buying into as gospel truth that's the problem that's the big reason why and so like I, I can be objective about it and go to PFF and use all of their objective stats so that that helps me the player evaluation. I can look at what's the, what's this quarterback's passer rating when he's targeted. That's a, that's a, that's a number in which you can plug in numbers and figure out the, figure out the answer. There is no arguing with that. That's objective as it gets their grading system, which is admittedly subjective by them is not. So that's why I have no reason to believe it. It's also a shortcut for not wanting to put tape on, but that's another conversation for another day, which we have already had with the TJ Watt defensive player of the year uh, snub, if you want to call it that. Um, it's it, some in, in some cases to me, some of these really subjective analytics are giving people an excuse <laughs> to be lazy to not watch the actual games. And, and yeah. it's to sit here and say, well, so-and-so said this. Well, no, how about you watch the game, cut on the tape and use your eyes to tell you who's better or what's good or what is good and working. So, but anyway, well, and the thing, and the thing is, and the thing is that, okay, let's just, okay, let's look at the stat that, that, that is so like pass rush win rate can be a nice stat to look at as a complimentary piece. But as soon as we start putting that number above actual sacks, that's a problem. Did the guy get to the quarterback or not? One number tells you, yes. The other number tells you, no. The yeah. other number can tell you a broader context of how often he wins his reps. That's a valuable way. To, that's a valuable thing that you could possibly against look at. Against the tackle, against the tackle or the guard or, right. or the center. Yeah. The, and the other thing for me is or like, okay, yeah. if, if we really want to start breaking down the value of things, like real value, how come we don't value third down sacks, right? Something like that. How come we don't value that? Because a sack on first down doesn't matter nearly as much as a sack on third down. Yeah. Because a sack on third down, usually vast majority of the time, unless the team is trailing and they have no other choice, almost always leads the, leads the team to punt. If you sack a quarterback on first down, they can still, they have two more downs to try to, to try to move the chains. So there's a, not all sacks are created equal. That's like PFF's thing. Well, not all sacks are created equal. If the guy gets completely unblocked and he gets a sack, he didn't really win his rep. Okay. Well, not all sacks are created equal in terms of getting one on first down versus third down. It, it's just, there are a number of different ways you can look at it, but I have, I'm much more inclined to believe in sacks over how often the guy wins his rep. Yeah. Not, I'm not discounting the pass rush win rate, but it's not more important than actually bringing the quarterback to the ground. No, no, it is not. Uh, Brent asks, are we going to have a Southside beat draft party? We need one. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, do, yeah. Corey's actually got to cover. I got to work draft. Yeah. He's got to actually work. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe if like night one of the draft, if DK and Corey can handle things on the South side, then maybe I can host one on here. Maybe we'll I can't, I can't make any promises. I will be making that. That, Corey can that, definitely that not make that promise. No, he's got a he's got an actual draft to cover, and if I were there, I'd be doing it too. So yeah. I don't think 
I cannot make any promises with that. But if we can, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. We got a long way to go on that. It'd be cool. 20, It'd be cool. 24 days to go until we hit that point. But for now, we will take our Monday and send you off to DK and Ramon coming up in about 25 minutes or so right here. Where you found this, please say April Fool's. Yeah, no, I'm not going to say April Fool's. I'm not I'm not the April Fool's guy. Nothing I, I've said today is April Fool's, by the way. If there's everybody, no if April I, Fool's in here. If anybody thinks that I am, trust me, I am doing nothing to blow smoke up. PFF. I don't think anybody can hear everything that I've said today and think that I'm blowing smoke up PFFs. But, but <laughs> I, uh, Pittsburgh Hornets asked me, what does draft day look like for you? What do you do on draft day or what are you planning? So I'll, I'll be on the south side. I'll be down the hall from where Art Rooney, Omar Khan, Mike Tomlin, Andy Weidel, the powers that be, make the draft picks. Uh, DK will be there as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, How this worked last year is, just using Broderick Jones as an example, um, you know, we were there obviously for night one, and the Steelers make one pick on night one. Um, We we wait for the pick to be made. Now, obviously, we're we're working before that. We show up a little early before the show starts. reporters are, are reaching out to people they may know and, and trying to see if they could get a little leg up on breaking who the pick is going to be. Um, but at some point the pick is made and, and we'll, we'll hop on a conference call with whoever that pick is last year. It was Roger Jones and they had him on a conference call right after, literally right after Mike Tomlin and Omar Khan made the call to Broderick. They transferred him over to the media room and, you know, one of those little conference phones. Um, so talk to Broderick Jones and start writing basically. So um, that's, that's the gist of draft day uh, on the South side. And then of course, day two and day three are open for, for us as well. So um, what happened last year was on night two, of course, that was also like a night nighttime draft thing. Roger Jones showed up to Pittsburgh and, and did the press, did his press conference Mm -hmm. there and did his intro there. Um, And then, but that's usually while the draft is going on. So like once you get, once you get to, uh, like w- once you get to the second night of the draft, you know, you've got like obviously the first round pick, you know, so like usually one guy is covering like once that guy walks into the room, but there's still a draft going on. So the other guy's actually like covering the draft while the other guy is yeah. paying attention um, to picks and everything. Um, and then it just so happened to work out last year with Joey Jr., who was picked at 32. Of course, that's the start of night two. Mm-hmm. So Joey Jr. was in town. He was he was home. Yeah. Uh, and so all he had to do was drive over to the South side and, and he did his press conference that night as well. So a um, little bit different, obviously, I don't, unless it's unless, unless, unless it's Zach Frazier, um, that probably won't happen again, but unless it's Frazier, maybe he's in town. You never know. Um, so we'll, we'll have to stand by for that. And then day three is more the same. It's like, okay, those route, those rounds go relatively quickly. So we'll, kind of sit and hang out and wait. And then once the picks are made, get on the conference call, talk to them and, and get information and, and see, Hey, what's it like? Congratulations. How do you feel? That whole thing. Mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah, so Panzer Shrek Pete says as an outsider, he oh. finds it fascinating yeah. uh, how it would work. It is in a way, it's also a little hectic. <laughs> so um, the draft yeah. is the draft is not that glammed up because it's no. very much a confined, like, rush of news and rush of information and you're kind of spinning at some points to try to work but it, it's cool to be there don't get me wrong it's the really uh cool to be there jeff asked and we gotta probably wrap it up after this he asked where do they have you in a, like a lounge area or conference room so the old media room was actually on the south side like right now the right now the media work room is actually across the street in the uh in a, in a small room in the in the um indoor, indoor facility. Facil- facility where the teams practice when uh when they practice inside um the old media room is is where the the media is held for the draft which is now i think the offensive line room i think yes, yes. and so since it's already kind of made for media they've got a table literally going all around like a- a- attached to the wall all around the room and so they'll sp- spread us all out you know, uh, around there and then they'll have tables and chairs set up in the middle as if it is a press conference so that whenever Mike Tomlin and Omar Khan walk in to break down their first round pick or in, in on nights two and three, of the draft, whenever it's a positional coach or offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, whoever is coming in to yeah. talk about a player, we just move l- literally from where we're at on our computer over 10 yes. feet to where we can sit and cover the press conference. So it's all in uh, <laughs> Pittsburgh Hornets well, with, with great internet. Uh, not ter- no. 
not terrible. It's a little bit better over there than it is uh, over in the indoor, indoor facility. I don't remember having any issues with internet last year. Well, once the TV companies get there and they That's start yeah. uploading from yeah. there and using that Wi-Fi, it slows way down. So yeah. it, it I don't depends. remember having any, any major issues during the draft last year, though. No. But, All right. We're out of here. Yeah. DK and Ramon coming up in 20 minutes or Draft so is live where you found this. 24 days, April 25th. Three. Yep, three weeks from Thursday. Yep, we're yep. almost there. Looking over at my there. calendar over here. <laughs> nice. We're Which there. won't it won't be on the wall for very much longer, though, because in a couple of weeks, my house is going to be on the market. Getting ready to make the move. Yep. Looking forward to seeing you back up here, friend. Mm. All right, we're out of here. He's Chris. I'm Corey. This has been the Southside Beat on a Monday. Don't get fooled today, please. Double check. I went the whole show and I didn't give you any April Fools. Neither did I. Double check. And please. I made no promises. Talk to you tomorrow. Cheers, everybody.